You've heard about blockchain and crypto, and it's gotten you excited. This is the future of money, you say, and you tell all your friends about it. But they're a skeptical bunch. What's a cryptocurrency, anyway? They ask. You throw a bucket of buzzwords at them. Decentralized, fiat, money printer, consensus. And before you know it, they've walked away, convinced you're crazy. But fear not, you are not crazy. And in this episode, we're going to show you exactly how not crazy you are and give those friends of yours something to think about. Ready? It's time for School of Block. Before we can properly wrap our heads around what a cryptocurrency is, it helps to know what a currency is in the first place. And you're in luck because we created a whole video about that already. So feast on the delight that is what is money, which you can find right here. And if you've already seen it, then let's crack the crack on. Now, of course, there are some technical differences between currency and money, primarily to do with one being an intangible concept and the other being the physical item we use to transact with. But fundamentally, a currency is a medium of exchange, and a good currency is one that is accepted by all parties in a given system. It's also divisible. <laughs> Durable. <gasps> Verifiable. Fungible. Not inflationary. Portable. And how do the US dollar, the euro, or the pound stack up when judged against these criteria? Well, these traditional currencies are all we've had for hundreds of years now, so we kind of just learn to accept their flaws. Forgery and theft have been high on the list for centuries, but the most <laughs> pressing flaw in our post-pandemic world, yeah, is inflation. Not just that, but there's a ton of friction in our use of those currencies as well. Intermediaries are always taking their cut, whether that's bank charges, Visa or MasterCard fees, or even foreign exchange rates, constantly grinding away at the value you put into the system. So, there's long been a gap in the market for a secure, frictionless, non-inflationary currency and one that's accepted around the world. And funnily enough, there's actually thousands of them out there already. But not all of them pass the first and most important test to be a medium of exchange accepted by everyone. Now, one of these newcomers is starting to get there and receiving huge attention as a result. Yes, you guessed it, Bitcoin. And if one cryptocurrency can gain acceptance, then it opens the door for many more to follow. Most cryptocurrencies are built on open source software, which is great for innovation and it means anyone can participate. Yes, even small players. Permissionless literally means you don't need permission. These are currencies governed by code and community, not centralized institutions. But this transparency and openness also makes them really easy to copy and launch your own standalone version, a process known as a fork. Fork. Just in case you were wondering. And that explains why there are just so many of them right now. Over 8,000 officially recognized compared to 180 of the regular, you know, fiat ones. Now, many of them are actually dead or just meme coins. But of the legitimate ones, there are in fact quite large differences between them at technological, philosophical, and governance level, which, well, do take some understanding. But on a core level, most share the same basic traits. So let's start with a definition. A cryptocurrency is a digital or virtual currency secured by cryptography, which makes it nearly impossible to counterfeit or double spend. So how does this work? Well, you've most likely heard of a ledger before. It's a simple balance sheet to record the flow of money, and it's usually housed in a safe accessible by only one person. Now imagine a ledger containing every transaction ever made in the currency of your choice, and there are not one, but hundreds of thousands of identical copies of that ledger stored around the world. And that ledger is public and viewable by anyone, anywhere. You can host a copy yourself and earn rewards for doing so. Every new transaction must be approved and verified by all existing copies before being accepted as a matter of record. This is known as a distributed ledger. In other words, distributed across many different computers. And it's the fundamental infrastructure that makes cryptocurrencies work. One of the hardest problems for a digital currency to solve is the double spend problem. Here's how to think of it. Imagine you've just been sent like the most well funny cat meme and you've just got to share it with all your mates. 
Oh, you get one. You get one. You get a copy. You get a copy. You get a copy. You all get a copy. One of the benefits, and of course, one of the problems with digital files is that they're extremely easy to replicate. Now, when I send a copy, it really is a copy, identical to the original. The receiver now is an exact duplicate of the one I've sent, so now instead of one, there are two. Now, obviously, if money is just a digital file and I start sharing it digitally, then, well, you get 100, you get 100, and that is the double spend problem. If I can send money like an image, then I can spend it twice, or an infinite number of times. To infinity and beyond! Digital technology is this great rushing river of movement, allowing everything to go wherever it wants. Solving the double spend problem is like trying to stop a tsunami with a toothpick. But that is exactly what Satoshi did in the Bitcoin white paper, and it's one of the most important principles behind the fidelity of Bitcoin as a digital currency. We propose a solution to the double spending problem using a peer-to-peer -peer distributed timestamp server to generate computational proof of the chronological order of transactions. The timestamp server within a peer-to-peer -peer network utterly profound. Until Satoshi's innovation, the double spend was the Achilles heel of digital currency transactions. It simply wasn't possible for a digital system to prove two or more different people didn't spend the same digital money without the use of an intermediary. Despite advances in payment tech and services, all internet-based transactions still required a trusted third party, such as a bank, government, or a credit card company. Not anymore. A further defining feature of cryptocurrencies is that they are generally not issued by any central authority. Governance is managed by thousands of individual stakeholders who generally run the computers that secure the network and receive the native token, in this case Bitcoin, as their reward. Generally known as mining, but you might also hear about staking or farming as well, and we'll look into those more in a future film. So what are the advantages of cryptocurrencies? Well, there is a few. They're theoretically immune to government interference or manipulation. They're frictionless. No grubby intermediaries getting their fingers in your pie. You don't need a bank to manage your funds. They are entirely in your control. International wire transfers are a glacial ripoff compared to the high speed and low cost of global crypto payments. No one can spend the same money twice. Most cryptocurrencies are transparent with the blockchain and all its transactions being publicly viewable. And they're provably scarce too, which makes them inflation resistant. And in the case of Bitcoin, the supply is capped at 21 million. There will never be more Bitcoin than that. Now, if all that is true, and it is, then why do cryptocurrencies feel so Scary. Scary. Well, to quote John Oliver, cryptocurrencies represent everything you don't know about money combined with everything you don't know about computers. And that's a lot of I don't know. But here's the magic. You don't actually have to understand the tech to use them. It's unlikely you understand how the internet is served to your home, but that doesn't stop you benefiting from high-speed broadband. But just like the internet, security is a paramount concern in blockchain. The code is new. And because we're talking about money here, it's catnip for hackers. Self-hosting a crypto wallet can also easily lead to human error, and there's no doubt that market volatility can be savage. We're doomed! But we're just starting to see the emergence of simpler, friendlier, less volatile products such as stablecoins, indexes, and hardware wallets. You don't have to be Nostradamus to see that physical cash is dying. And this has only been accelerated by the global pandemic. I can't remember touching physical money even once last year, apart from that, of course. Now, if the value of your hard-earned currency is being eroded with every squirt of quantitative central bank easing, don't you think maybe it's time we started looking at money in a different way? Cryptocurrencies are not the perfect solution, but they are being adopted by more and more institutions for the same reasons they might previously have adopted gold. And that alone shows the tide is changing. You've been watching School of Block presented by Ledger and The Defiant, demystifying decentralization one block at a time. Don't forget to subscribe, drop us a like if that's what you're into, and as always, here's to your financial freedom. Could you not get a smaller glass, mate?